Welcome, welcome, welcome to the Talent Empowerment Podcast, where we support human transformation and share the stories of great leaders of all backgrounds so you can borrow their vision, their tools, their tactics to build your own plan towards happiness. I am your host, The Real Tom Finn, and on today's show, we have PK. PK Kriya, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me, Tom. If you don't know PK, let me just take a second and introduce you to this fabulous human. Uh, She's an employee benefits consultant with Marsh McLennan Agency and provides advice on health and welfare plans. If you don't know what that is, don't worry. We'll explain it in just a second. She's an expert in well-being and wellness programs, has a diverse base of corporate clients that she works with, and she helps corporate leaders understand the full scope and implications of costs in various employee benefit strategies. Now, PK was honored in Minneapolis and St. Paul in the Business Journal as a Woman in Business Award and has won that and has also won awards as the Employee Benefit Advisors Most Influential Woman in Benefit Advising, which is pretty cool as well. She's involved in several community organizations, as you would expect, in the Minneapolis, Minnesota area, and I am just thrilled to spend some time with her today. I will tell you, you know, PK, you've done a lot for women in business, and we're going to get to your career and what you do and how you do it, all those things. But what about serving other women tends to lift you up? Well, when other women shine, I think that's really me passing on the torch. And uh, I think of all the women that really showed me the way, and I owe it to all the future leaders to also um, give back in the manner in which others have given back to me. Well, beautifully said and a great opening to to our discussion. I've known PK for about a year and I'll tell you, she just does things differently. And I think you're going to hear that through our conversation today. Things are just done a little different uh, the way PK touches uh, each of her relationships. So help us understand what you do and, and what kind of business you're in. Well, like you mentioned, I'm an employee benefits consultant, and my team and I work with employers on their total reward strategy, which means all of their group employee benefits, health insurance, dental, life, disability, and everything in between. And we are strategic partners to our clients. Uh, I like to think of us as a trusted advisor, and we support not only HR leaders, but the CFO, the CEO, the entire C-suite, as well as all the employee population that actually utilizes the benefits that we consult about. Yeah, so I've got a little background in employee benefits and and did that as part of my career journey. But I will tell you that these roles as consultants to large organizations, medium, small organizations, really doesn't matter the size, are really tough jobs. They are really intricate around product details, scalability, and then relationship building at the corporate level. How do you build relationships with a new client? Because you're very good at this. Help our, our listeners understand what that looks like in your model. Making connections is uh, my mantra and really truly trying to find a common thread with each person that I meet. And when I do, I hone in on that. And then, of course, you know, sales 101, you need to establish trust and And you can't do that without really having something to lead you there. So I like to, like, I almost look at it like a a research project. How can I figure out what it is that I have in common with this person? And how can I build upon that to establish a relationship and build trust? And that is what I do. And I learned that early in my sales career. And I um, continue to strive to do that today. And that's what I also coach uh, a lot of young people to do the same. Yeah, well, well said. And so, as you're as you're building these relationships and you're being authentic, what do you actually deliver for your clients? What's the you, you mentioned healthcare and dental and life insurance and wellness programs? So, what does that actually look like for those that are not experts in this field and they're you know within an organization? What does that mean? I think of it. You know, we are not. We don't sell a product. We sell consulting services. So we consult with employers to guide them on what they should do. How should they invest in their employees with what types of, whether it's insurance coverage or other benefits, 
anything that an employer offers to an employee to engage them to create an incredible employment experience. So the actual work itself, all the fine details around negotiating pricing and thinking of us almost like a wholesaler, where the carriers come to the broker, the broker negotiates the price and the contracts, well, the true recipient is the employee, and our job is to make sure the employees understand what it is they have from an insurance perspective. But our true job really is consulting and guiding and coaching and providing expertise. Yeah, and this is a deep and rich field with lots of products and lots of partners and lots of tentacles that, that go in a lot of different directions. How do you as a leader keep your head on straight with all of these different things that you're supposed to know and quite frankly, be an expert in? Quite frankly, it's the power of a team. I have a really, really rock solid and rock star team and I could do it without them. So I give them all the accolades. I just, I, I lead them there and they take over. Um, and so I always say, I use the analogy, I'm a conductor of an orchestra. I don't play the instruments. My team plays the instruments. They understand deeply the intricacies and all the details and all the plans. And if they don't, I find someone else who does. And I know enough to be dangerous. And that is truly the honest answer to your question. I can't know everything. My team can't know everything. If we don't know it, we'll find an answer or we find someone who does. And, and that's really the way that great leaders answer that question, my friends. It's mm -hmm. always about the team. It's never about the individual. Uh, great organizations, great teams, great communities are, uh, are team players. And you've got to be on a team uh, with a great leader to, uh, to understand that. Or you've got to be a great leader yourself that respects the team along the way. Either one is great. Uh, it's just when you're missing one of those that uh, you fall into a little bit of a trap. So let's get to know you a little bit because uh, we understand the business and we know you're focused on relationships. Um, but did you just always start in benefits? How did this uh, you know, progression take place? I actually didn't start in benefits. I started my career in the staffing industry and that's where I first learned the career of sales. And I sold to HR leaders and um, people who managed their talent acquisition. And I did that for a quite a long period of time. And then I got bored and was looking to make a change. And who did I ask but my financial planner? Hey, I could have that kind of confidential conversation. I'm thinking about doing something else. And he introduced me to the founders of our company and we had breakfast and very candidly, I knew nothing about this industry. I just wanted to know if there was another industry that I could leverage my network and use my sales skills. And they said they'd teach me the business. I really liked them. I thought I can work for these guys. So that's how I landed here 20 years ago. That, that's amazing. So, so you're looking for a new job. You're thinking through what are my options? You end up landing at breakfast and you have a great conversation and here we are 20 years later. Did I capture that pretty quickly? You did, you did. And I started working part-time. I was a new mom and I thought, I can't, I, I don't wanna do this full-time. I, I feel like sales is a great career that you can work on your schedule and still produce if you're really good. So I literally started in this industry part-time, not knowing or understanding the industry. That's, that's amazing. So let's talk about this mom period, um, early stage, because I think there's a lot of women out there that face that challenge as well. Um, there's a lot of conflicting uh, opinions here, but I would tell you, it's not easy. I watched my wife do it. Uh, she's a working mom. Uh, we've got uh, three, three kids, one on the way, and it's not easy to do. Uh, so how did you, how did you leverage part-time work and being, my goodness, a full-time mom as well? I did the best I could with what I had. And so, you know, I'm a, I literally thrive on utilizing resources and I'm pretty decent at it, finding and identifying um, whatever it is that there's a gap, I find it. And so I had people to help me with my kids. I had a really strong team to help me with the industry. And then very much not unlike other high performers that it was on me, to rein it in and navigate how much I work versus how much I'm parenting and 
and trying to blend that. I've always said, I never use the word balance because balance implies imbalance. Mm -hmm. You're either on the top of the teeter totter on the bottom and you really can get it like that. So I firmly believe in work life blend. And how do you blend? Because the whole person comes to work. So I've spent my career, you know, I, I've spoken about it. I live it. My team knows it. I'm authentic with my team. I'm not hiding personal things on my calendar. Uh, that's not how we're going to progress as a gender. We have a life outside of work and we merge them together and we do our best. And so I'm very, um, I'm proud of that. And my kids know that. And there's a lot that they benefit from um, when I'm, when they watch and listen and learn, whether it's just sitting in the car with me. Yeah, I always called it work-life integration uh, mm -hmm. rather than work-life balance. And I completely agree with you. You've got to figure out how to integrate your personal and your professional life. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, you know, all that personal life could have a lot of bullets under it. That's totally okay. But you've got to figure out how to do both and integrate them. And you've got to be with an employer. This is important. An employer Absolutely. who gets it. Absolutely. And there are certainly those that don't. Um, and, uh, we've, we've all come across them. Uh, we hear about them in the news as well, but what's, what's your take on how somebody can actually model this type of behavior? You mentioned a couple of tips there. Keep your calendar open. Don't be afraid to have personal events. I would imagine during the week. Is that kind of what you're saying there? What are some, what are some other things that we can think about on how to integrate this well? I think it's really important to protect your calendar and, and let's not forget about the me time because if we're not good, I'm not good for my team or my family um, or my clients. So making sure you're allowing team time or I'm sorry, in person time, you know, taking care of yourself time. And I protect my calendar for that. I, um, I, there's really, I really struggle to have early morning meetings because I need my me time. So my meetings generally start at eight. I will do it earlier. I used to, when I was younger in my career, have seven and 7.30 meetings all the time. As I've aged, I like eight o'clock meetings because I really need that time in the morning to get centered and take care of myself. So I believe, you know, step one is we have to take care of ourselves first to make sure we can take care of others. And when you're in a servant leadership role, that's just so important. Yeah, well said. And and most good leaders, as as you outline, have some sort of morning routine that is well protected. And uh, some people say, oh, I don't want to get up at 5 a.m. You don't have to. Uh, nope. You can slide your day around as it fits your sleep patterns and how it fits your energy. But it should be pretty consistent where on a daily basis, you know, hey, from X to Y time, I'm doing these two or three things that get me centered for the day. Uh, tell us about your morning routine, PK. Morning routine is, oh, uh, first I need a really good night's rest and that's not always the case. Uh, and then it's 6 AM and a 20 minute or 30 minute Pilates video, a really good cup of coffee and let my dogs out. And then the day begins. Yeah. Perfect. And, and for everybody, it's going to be different um, mm -hmm. depending on where you live and, and what your activities are that center you. Um, but some form of exercise in the morning is, is always a good idea uh, yes. to get our bodies moving and stretched and, uh, you know, behaving in the way that we, we want so that we can have a great mental game uh, throughout the day. So certainly, certainly agree with that. Um, as, we, as we start to learn more about you, what are the key principles that you use for consistency and results? Because you're, you're at the top of your game in sales. There's got to be some principles that you're leaning on for consistency. Because it's not like it wasn't an accident that you got to this point in your career. From a business development perspective, if we take COVID out of the picture, we must eat. We must have beverages. And so literally I try to meet people for coffee, lunch, and or dinner or happy hour. Because why? That's how you create relationships. That's how you get to know people. 
conversations. You really get to learn about someone. Um, and so truthfully, I used to say someone in business development shouldn't ever be in their office because they needed to be out talking to people. If I'm not talking to people, I'm not developing relationships or earning trust. So that is one of my fundamental go-tos. Another one is, you know, at this stage in my career, I, I take meetings and network anytime someone reaches out. I don't like to say no. Why? Because I want to give back. People gave to me. I want to give back. And that might be uh, a 20 minute meeting. There's a really good book uh, by an author, Marsha Ballinger, called The 20 Minute Networking Meeting. And if you follow that and you think in your mind, everyone can say yes to 20 minutes. And COVID changed that. I don't have to. If someone used to say, can you meet me for a cup of coffee? And I have to drive 30 minutes and then meet the person for an hour and then another 30. That's two hours. I'm not saying no in this virtual environment because I can I can carve out 20 minutes for anyone. So I, I really, um, I like to do that. It's respectful. And you never know when someone might provide you with a nugget of something that can help you. I believe in reverse mentoring. So these young people, I may learn from them. And so I, um, you know, that's another mantra of mine is I say yes. Just and, say yes. Mm -hmm. and, and there's an art to saying no. And you might get to that question, Tom, but uh, because you also need to learn to say no to things that don't fill you. And so that that frees you up to be able to say yes to the things you want to say yes to. You Maybe don't yet. want to be so busy that the, that you have to say no to something you really want to do. That's right. The yes sometimes feels easy, right? Mm -hmm. uh, because most people genuinely want to help. They want to say yes. How do you say no then gracefully without um uh, coming across as maybe maybe arrogant or or less than that maybe just a stick in the mud or too busy or whatever the thing is that you think you're going to be labeled one of the answers to that is the 20 minutes so instead of saying no which i previously may have to more people that have reached out to me i'll say 20 minutes virtual meeting I also am a big proponent of the word and. I don't like to use but. So if it doesn't work to meet, I will make sure that I at least provide them with one nugget. Maybe it's a link to a website of a company or if I have a good understanding of what it is they're looking for, that I still give them at least this might be something you want to check out or this might be a better person for you to connect with based on why you've reached out to me. I'll give an example. People come to me looking for an HR job or a finance job, or um, I can help them. If an IT person comes to me or a programmer, I don't have as many contacts to programmer jobs. So I might refer them to someone else who does. Um, and so if I have a good understanding of what they're looking for, that helps me know how to guide them. Uh, but I don't like to say no. Well, that is a beautiful way to do it. And I love how you're trying to provide value at every turn. You're trying to give value to others along your journey in which they will give value to you. Uh, maybe not immediately, uh, but mm -hmm. some point down the road. And that's the way a fair value exchange happens um, within personal and professional relationships. It's, it's just that simple. I mean, right. I think of it in a really simple way as chips on a table. You know, your green chips and your red chips. And when mm -hmm. I'm giving, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm giving my green chips away. And when I'm taking, we've got the red chips moving, right? We want to mm -hmm. have a balance of, of giving and receiving in our relationships. And it sounds like you're very conscious of that um, within your own philosophy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is, is there a point in your career that you get to um, where you're at the height of your career where you have some regrets from along the way? Ooh, oh, I got to think about that one, Tom. I mean, I, I, I think once you start really feeling success, you will always 
worry that you didn't spend enough time with your kids or weren't present in those moments. And I have regrets about that for sure. Because I wasn't always present. Why? Because I was thinking about work, thinking about closing a deal, thinking about solving a problem for a client when maybe my kids needed me. And that was more important. And that's on me. You know, that's uh, the ability to be present, which is something I have to work on. Yeah, I think we all feel that way as parents, right? E even if we were 100% present, we'd probably feel like we weren't 100% present uh, yeah. for our kids. Like we're, we're our own worst critic uh, when it comes to, to being parents. Is there is there something in your business career that you felt like perhaps you stubbed your toe along the way? Because all of this sounds rosy and great, and we know how successful you are and, and, and how talented you are in your space. But were there a couple of moments where you did stub your toe? Yeah, I mean, this didn't come uh, easy for me. I worked in an industry prior to this one where I could sell something every day. And this industry has a very long sales cycle. So I'm often asked about the early part of my career. And I would say the first five years I would not want to do again. That was hard. It tested the core of my being. I was comfortable and confident in a previous role. And I came into this business with a lack of confidence. What did I do? Did I really give up something that I was decent at to try this unknown? And those first five years were hard, really hard. And it was um, hard to learn everything I needed to learn and very hard to stay motivated when the sales cycle is as long as it is. So I'll challenge young people who join this business. There's 365 days in a year. If you close one deal a month, that's 12 deals. What do you do for 353 days to keep yourself motivated, confident, courageous, energetic, and not give up? And so uh, I still face that. There's a lot of, you know, that imposter syndrome that goes on and it still happens. Can you explain a little bit more about that? I think, you know, there's always a, a fear that I'm not showing up or I'm missing something or that someone else is doing it better. And on the one hand, I think that drives a lot of people to be their best, right? Because you need a healthy competition. And on the other hand, you really have to work through that self-doubt. And I get a lot of energy from that. And it's exhausting. There's my and. Perfectly placed and. A lot of energy and it's exhausting. So we all have a little bit of imposter syndrome. And I think what you highlighted is how hard it is for those that have long sales cycles and may only close 10 or 12 deals a year uh, on 10 or 12 really good days out of 365. So when you're, when you're explaining this to somebody who's, who's new in the industry or building their customer base, how do you tell them to get through those first five years? What, what are they actually going to be facing? How do they overcome this? I am big into uh, encouraging tracking. So track how many people are you talking to? How many emails are you sending? How many handwritten note cards are you writing? Because if you're writing a handwritten note card, that means you've talked to somebody. Mm -hmm. So track it. Make a spreadsheet. You know, whatever it is, however you like to measure or quantify, make sure you're quantifying so that on a Friday you can look back at Monday to Thursday and say, wow, I did talk to a lot of people. This is what I learned about them. This is what it led me to. The other thing I'll tell people is you never, ever know what one person might bring to you in your career. I, I like to tell the story about my daughter's godfather, who was a retired lawyer, who I told him about my new career change. He's not working anymore. I thought, why, you know, I just was telling him what I was doing. Well, he referred me to his former law firm. They're still a client. And he referred me to his best friend's company. They're still a client. Wow. And I never would have thought that. 
And so I encourage people. That's another reason you say yes to a meeting because you don't know some person in a career transition, vulnerable moment that just needs some words of wisdom. Their friend may own a business and could be a potential client or their friend may have a need for something that I have some insight on. Another relationship building moment. So, yeah, did I answer your question? I think I did. I, I think so. I, and, and you're back to your core theme of providing value at all turns and, and also um, <laughs> building relationships with people over time. So that example of I've had that client for 20 years um, from one conversation is a great example to others in any business. It doesn't matter if you're in health and wellness. It's really any business. How do you build relationships over a couple of decade period? And I would imagine that it would be really hard for somebody to go in and try to compete with you on those clients. Would you agree? I'd like to think so. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's relationship driven, right? We're all humans. We're all looking for that human connection and we're all looking for those deep and meaningful uh, relationships. I, I think you've got this unique view on the world. And I want to double click on this just a little bit because when you look at product and service and consulting, you don't tend to look at product and service. I feel like you tend to look at people and how are people going to feel and react. Talk a little bit about your your vision uh, and how you view sort of the human experience. I think it's really like the most important thing for us when we enter a partnership with a client is understanding their business, understanding their core values, understanding uh, how they lead, how they differentiate themselves as an employer and the employment experience, which then guides how we consult with them. So we, we have to understand the company and culture first. The products are second. And so that's, uh, for me, that's, and my team, that is a differentiator for us. We don't just dive right into all the lines of coverage, for example. What's going on in the business? How, what's your growth strategy? What is your turnover? What is your, um, you know, some of your succession planning? A lot of companies going through that right now. Do you plan to grow through M&A? Are you moving into new markets? We do our best work when we, you know, still goes back to Stephen Covey, you know, seek first to understand and then to be understood. We've got to understand their business first. Do you think a lot of people forget that part? I do. Not intentionally, but I think it's easy to go into your comfort zone, which is the product knowledge. Mm -hmm. And I just, culture and what I've learned and how we've branded ourselves. And my personal brand is that we get to know them first. We can't try to, it's like, you know, selling anything. You can't just try to sell someone a Ford if they came to the lot wanting a Toyota, like you got to figure that out first. So maybe they're at the wrong dealership. Maybe they are. Or right. maybe, or maybe a, through a conversation, you can figure out that they just needed a pickup truck, and it didn't matter mm -hmm. what the brand was. They just right. needed to haul stuff, right? Right. And and that's really where it comes uh, together through a consultative discussion, is what you're saying. Right. And, and I think a lot of people forget this part. We we go right into where we're comfortable, product knowledge. I, let me tell you all the things I know, versus let me ask you about yourself and your business. Do you ever? you ever feel like you get stuck in those conversations early on, meaning you haven't built trust yet. It's still an early relationship and they don't want to answer your questions because they're not comfortable with you yet. Do you, do you feel that ever? Yes. And I really like asking what and how questions. And whenever you're talking to an entrepreneur or, or a business leader, they want to talk about their business. It, it makes them feel good. So when you ask, what are you doing differently in your market to position yourselves? How do you recruit? What makes your employer 
your employee experience different than your competitor? Why would I want to work for you? Um, ask what, how, why questions all day long about them. Walls come down generally. And then, of course, if you do your homework first, I see that. I researched you and it's really impressive that. So you show up to them that you've invested in them. That feels good too. You know, when I meet with candidates who are looking for a job and in transition, it means a lot to me that they knew a little bit about me first and don't just enter a conversation like with no background on me. And I will often coach people on that. You shouldn't meet someone blindly without doing the research because when I, when I was young, I didn't have access to the internet. That ages me. Today, you can find out a lot about me on the internet. So there's no excuses today to not come prepared to understand and know people in their business. Yeah, these are great tips and tricks that people can use um, to have a sound business jumping off point, right? You got to look, it's as easy as looking at LinkedIn. Let's not get too fancy here. Go exactly. to LinkedIn, find the person, click on their profile, read through it, connect with them. Um, potentially after you meet with them. That's kind mm -hmm. of the way I like to do it is I'll look at their LinkedIn profile. I'll go through, I'll look at the schools they went to. Did I go to any of those schools or do I know right. someone? Right. And then I'll, I'll look at the interests that they have, maybe their community organizations. I certainly yes. want to know where they live because I yes. don't want to say something silly like, Hey, isn't New York great when they live in Minnesota? Um, right. <laughs> because that shows right off the bat, I'm not paying attention. And so this, this little step that PK just, just gave us all is it sounds simple, but I would argue that less than 10% of people do it and good salespeople do it. Sure. And, and we know that. And I imagine PK, your entire team does it because they're developed by you, but I don't see people doing it as often as maybe they should. And it's simple and it only takes a second. Mm -hmm. and, and sometimes, I mean, I don't know how, how you are, but if I'm jammed for time, I can do it really quick within 60 seconds of going to a call. Exactly. I'm between, yeah. I'm between calls. Right. And I've got 60 seconds. Oh my goodness. Let me just type into LinkedIn really quickly. Find this person, do a quick review of their, you know, their online resume there and get a better understanding for who they are. Mm -hmm. yeah, and you're honoring them. You know, you're making, you're, you're showing someone that they're, they're special and they're worthy of 60 seconds. Right. And, and it mm -hmm. doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be a long elaborate, um, you know, down a rabbit hole, we go into all the social media platforms and, and looking at this person from every angle. It doesn't have to be that. Um, right. it, can if, it can, if you want, uh, certainly if the relationship that you're looking for is a long-term relationship, you kind of want to like this person. Uh, if you're right. going to be working with them for a long time, right? You just want to right. like them. Um, right. And if, and if you look at their hobbies, their activities, their family, all the cool stuff that they're doing and you really enjoy what they're up to, you're going to do a better job for them as well. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I always feel like that's so such an important part of this, of this sales cycle. I, I was asking you about sort of the people experience earlier and, and I want to phrase the question a little bit differently. Um, because you look at the experience of the employee and how that affects the executive team and how that affects the community and how you bring people together from, from multiple companies to create an experience. So talk about just the way you look at putting people together from different companies and, and how you do that in terms of building, um, you know, community for yourself and for your customers. Uh, thank you for the question, Tom. I, uh, one of the things I did, I think it was 2016, I really wanted to bring together my clients in an advisory board fashion from a lens of A, me learning from them what's important to them, but B, them learning from one another, almost in a unique coaching model and a collaborative model. So in 2016, I formed a client advisory board and they, um, I would just say I, you know, they were handpicked. I knew they would 
I just knew their personalities. I knew that they, the synergy would be right. And I think there, that is a dynamic that is, that's super important when you put groups together and not always easy and sometimes taken for granted when it really works well, but all it takes is to have one person to not quite fit for you to understand how challenging that might be. Then COVID hit and I, and my colleagues and I said, we got to do more of this. They're just, HR leaders are craving support. So fast forward to 2023, I have three more HR roundtables, and then I also have CFO roundtables. And people want to support one another and feel supported. And so you create a platform and you make it easy for them. Another mantra for me is make it easy for them. How do you make it easy for them? It's a monthly meeting. It's every Wednesday at 8 a.m., first of the month, first Wednesday of the month. And it's one hour and it's virtual. It used to be in 2016 when I started these, it was every other month for two hours in person. That got challenging because logistics, weather. So we're still meeting in person. We're getting back to that, but not every month. And attendance is much higher when you can pop on a call and just start supporting one another. And that's what we do. Yeah, look, it sounds easy the way you said it. Uh, it sounds super easy. The nuance here uh, for those that are listening is you've got to put the right people together. So how do you how do you think about that? Do you think about their personalities? Do you think about their job titles? Do you think about what they're into um, personally? How, their their demographics in terms of location and gender and age and those types of things. What do you, how do you do it? How do you think through that? I don't have a perfect answer for you, Tom, because I'm still learning. I do like having similar roles. They do not need to be similar sized companies. One thing I've learned in my career is the perception that you need to have big company leaders talking to big company leaders. I disagree. You can learn so much from one another. Um, and so the size of the company is not important. The role itself is important. And, um, and so now what's changed for me is, you know, I have more total rewards people in one group. I have managers, directors in one group, and then I have VPs, CHROs, chief people officers in another group. And that's not perfect because there might be a day that works better for someone than the other and we'll slide them in and it might not fit perfectly, but they're still going to get some nuggets and they're still going to be able to feel supported. And I'd rather have them feel supported than not supported and say, no, I don't have a group for you. Yeah, I, I love the way you're doing this. So you're doing it by by title and experience where they're around other like minded people in the same types of roles. And then they get to bring whether it's large company, small, medium company experience to the table because it's just experience in business. Um, and we have different angles that we can look at when we're thinking about these things. I love it. I absolutely love it. I think it's a great idea. And it's no surprise as to why everybody looks to you as a, as a cherished advisor, you know, along their journey, um, when you're bringing everybody together in a community. Can I add one more thing? Of course you can. From a sales perspective, what I also do is I'll bring prospects in there. HR leaders I've met, but I'm really enjoying getting to know that, you know what, maybe you benefit from having this kind of support. So from a sales perspective, you know, then there's a, a little bit of pressure, perhaps like, wow, oh, you're getting that it, with your consulting services. We're not getting that. So it can happen kind of naturally. And then I'm not selling them. Yeah, that is a really nice playbook. Mm -hmm. uh, so what you do is you put your list of customers together by um, title and then you bring in prospects within those titles to let them experience it, be a part of it, meet some new people in your industry, um, in the HR or finance space, whatever it might be. That way you build your community along the way. And naturally they say, hey, PK, I really like this group. Can I stay? And oh, by the way, can we talk about working with you directly? Is right. that how it goes? Right. Well, in a perfect world, absolutely. <laughs> Thanks. It's just that well, easy. You know, is there somebody else that, you know, one thing I should be asking is, is there anybody else that you think might benefit from joining the group? 
And you know, what I get so much energy from is doing things different than my peers. I'm in a male dominated industry. 85% of my competitors are men. I like doing it differently. Yeah, well said. Well, you uh, you stand out above the crowd, male male dominated industry or not. It sounds like you are dominating the industry, and uh, I am thrilled to have had the chance to share this time with you, and uh, and quite frankly, get to know you over the last over the last year as we've started to work together on a few things, um, which I'm very grateful for as well. So, PK, thanks for joining the Talent Empowerment Podcast. Thrilled to have you on the show. If people want to get in touch with you, they want to be a part of your community. Maybe they're in Minneapolis area and they want to meet you for a 20-minute meeting online or have coffee, lunch, or cocktails with you. Um, how do they get a hold of you? Good old-fashioned LinkedIn is the best place to start. Or they can email me and we can put that in the show notes, Tom. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, we are thrilled to have you. We'll put all of that in the show notes, um, including the book reference uh, that PK made earlier. We'll get a link to that as well. Uh, and thank you, my friends, for joining the Talent Empowerment Podcast. I hope you transform yourself and your business by placing humans at the center, levering te leveraging technology at speed, and enabling innovation at scale. Let's get back to people and culture together. We'll see you on the next episode, everybody.